break for lunch, and then three more talks after lunch, and then there will be that half hour discussion session. So try to keep all six talks in your head. Um, our first talk is by Christina Stinson, and she's going to tell us about Greg Lee's allergies. So just to follow up on David's introduction this morning, um, in this session I'm going to be sort of changing gears a little bit and talking about new research directions that are emerging from a recently funded collaboration between colleagues here at the Harvard Forest and public health scientists at the University of Massachusetts and um, potential plans for linking those to other ongoing and new research activities. For many of us in the room are scientists who work on issues related to climate change and global change, uh, broadly speaking. And clearly there is um, a, a lot of interest in what changes in the environment actually mean for human beings, particularly for human health. And so this is just one of many different innovations put together by the IPCC, there's one by the um, World Health Organization and others looking at trying to, to grapple with the many interacting factors <laughs> environmental change that are potentially in influencing human health. And one of the major concerns, of course, is that global changes are affecting air quality. So air quality is something that is um, affecting numerous kinds of public health signals. There are, there are um, particulate matter and other air quality issues that have direct influences on mortality. This, these two graphs show um, childhood asthma, which is on the rise. And you can also see that there are socioeconomic considerations here as well because children, um, this is child asthma, and um, children of underserved communities are actually suffering more from child asthma related to air quality than other populations. So looking at this, um, the ecological drivers for, for these kinds of aspects of um, human health are important from not only um, the landscape that we work in here, the natural landscape, but also the, the human um, interface between um, ecology and the settled or developed environment. Mm -hmm. So ragweed, common ragweed or ambrosia or eugifolia, is a widespread native plant. It is very common in agricultural fields and other kinds of disturbed sites in rural areas, but it's also a very common weed of urban environments. Um, it is the primary trigger for hay fever allergies during the fall. Produces a pollen, a pollen protein called the AMBA1 protein, and this is one of the major um, factors in hay fever suffering. So the outlook for this species, based on uh, growing body of literature and the work that we and others have been doing, is not so good um, in terms of just human, human health. We know that ragweed is going to um, increase its growth, its reproduction. Up to 61% pollen production, um, increase in pollen production has been shown in response to elevated CO2 alone. And we also know from very recent work that the length of the ragweed pollen season is also increasing dramatically through time, and that's particularly important in higher latitudes where the date of first, the date of first frost is um, being pushed out. So how do we scale from um, what we know about climate variation to making predictions about influences on ragweed allergies? Well, you might think that you can simply go from these nice little predictive maps that if any of you have, have allergies, you've probably been able to log on to the Weather Channel or Pollen.com or some of these other sources and see. Type in your zip code and you get your pollen outlook for the day. And this is actually um, real data that was shown from October of um, 2010. The problem is that these data are being generated from 75 different pollen stations nationwide that are essentially capable of, we don't really know the details of, of the scale of this, but essentially they are only able to measure pollen within a 16 square kilometer um, area from the center point of the pollen station. So clearly that's not enough to capture the kind of climate variation that we see um, across the continent and um, makes it very, a very coarsely um, generated data set. Another major problem with this is that we know that there's genetic variation in the response of Bradley to global change conditions. And this is just a, a reaction <laughs> one showing the response of different genotypes to ambient versus elevated CO2. And you can see that those that are large under ambient conditions and those that are 
producing the most, uh, reproducing the most and producing the most pollen, are actually becoming suppressed under elevated conditions. And um, conversely, those that are subordinate under ambient conditions become the dominant ones in high CO2. And so what that means is that predicting the response of this species to various climate changes is really a moving target. And you have to keep in mind that there are likely to be matches between individual populations of this species and their local environment that would be difficult to scale up to a continental scale without knowing something about their population biology. So the uh, goal of this new study is to really look at ragweed allergies from a, a population to landscape level, focusing on the, the possibility that there's variation among the <coughs> ecotypes of the species. And so the region that um, we're focusing on is, is in England. You can see here that um, New England has its own climate gradient going from warmer to cooler as you move um, north. But also this north, this south north gradient also to some extent represents an urban to rural gradient. If you zoom into Massachusetts, you can see this gradient um, represented at a smaller spatial scale. So if you move out from Boston to the Berkshires, you also go from warmer to cooler. And you also relatively <coughs> go from um, urban to rural, more rural environments. And so this is this sets the stage for um, studying pollen and gravity distribution at the scale that is relevant to public health, but also takes into account the potential for ecotypic variation among these populations. It's a three-phase research plan. Um, it includes first a regional model, which we're about halfway through, <coughs> basically a, a presence-absence survey looking at the distribution of this species throughout the landscape, a climate space envelope experiment that actually is designed to test for the variation in ecotypic response to global change factors. And then finally, putting these two together into predictive maps that will help us predict not only current, but also future um, areas where pollen allergy risk could be the highest. So I'm going to talk through most of the talk and I'm going to focus on um, phase one, because that's who we are at the moment. Um, and in this phase of research, the goal is to relate climate, land cover, and human data to, to various pollen risk factors. And so the data that we're collecting at the population level is really um, categorized into three different risk factors, abundance, timing, and potency. Abundance is, is broadly speaking, measured using Burkhardt traps, which are air samplers on um, which you can get uh, a pollen count. The timing is basically measured at the population level, looking at timing of onset, peak, and duration of the flowering season. So we're looking at these as actually in local um, ragweed populations, but also under experimental conditions. And then the potency is quite interesting, and this is um, part of the collaboration with the University of Massachusetts. It's done at the molecular scale, looking at concentrations of this AMBA1. <coughs> So the first step in this process is to really begin to get higher resolution pollen counts. Again, using these Burkhardt traps. Burkhardt trap basically sits on a rooftop and spins around. It has a small um, vacuum pump inside that sucks in air. Whatever is in the air gets stuck on a tape, and then you can take that tape into the lab and um, count pollen grains, among other things. You can do this now at a much higher spatial scale. There are traps that are set up at the at, um, rooftop of BU. There's one at the Concord Field Station in Concord, representing sort of the suburban Boston environment. We have one at the Harvard Forest, one at the University of Massachusetts. There is another one in the works out in the Berkshires, and a, a, another we may eventually tap into in Springfield as well. So you can see we're moving across this climate gradient and also <coughs> urban to rural gradients to work with um, across that landscape as well. <coughs> so the goal is then to couple the pollen data, using the Burkhardt traps, to field data on the distribution of ragweed. These are randomly generated points, um, beginning at our focal cities of New York City, Boston, and Burlington, Vermont. Um, this, this is basically giving us random points to go out and look for ragweed and to score not only the degree to which we find ragweed presence or absence, but also field attributes in the landscape, such as how much pavement and buildings do we see, how much nice lawn, how much forest, how much agriculture, and so forth. And those are all real places that we went to in our first round with this presence absence survey. It's in some ways some of the most fun field work I've ever done. Um, 
So the idea then is to take this data set, and this is just a table showing that these various risk factors are being measured at different spatial scales. So we will be able to take the bird card trap data to look at um, different scales of pollen in the, in the atmosphere. There are also going to be these allergen assays, the plant technology and the plant growth and democracy, et cetera, from the, the field data sets. And that allows us to begin working with models to uh, basically score the risk factors in space. <coughs> Another data layer that we're interested in, in addition to land cover and the things that we're measuring in the field, of course, is what this means for human populations. And one of the resources for this is to draw upon the U.S. Census data layers. And so, just for example, this is population density and household income. They're basically um, related with one another. You can see these strong urban to rural transects for New York and for Massachusetts. A little bit different story, a little bit more scattered for Vermont. But you can combine these things and uh, begin to run models using various kinds of regression approaches to see what are the major factors contributing to presence and abundance of ragweed in the landscape. And this is just very preliminary data from our first presence absence survey. You can see that things like temperature show up in various ways of, of examining these um, relationships. So we know that temperature is certainly playing a role. Um, human population is also coming out. And then importantly, we also see that agriculture and bare soils are a signal. And that's not surprising given the ecology of these species. So this is just zoomed in onto Massachusetts, showing some of our presence and absence um, survey points. The ones that are circled in red are those that actually had ragweed present, and then the different land cover categories are, are put in the pie chart. So you can see that um, agriculture, which is the yellow, links on quite a few times when you have uh, ragweed present, and as does bare soil, and to some extent right of ways and edges are also playing a role. But interestingly, when you get into a very urban setting, so this is all pavement, this was a site that was all pavement, you tend to get no ragweed. And so while we expect to see it, you, you expect to see, um, you know, lots of you expect to see lots of redweed in highly disturbed, highly fragmented landscapes. But um, there's also this broader landscape scale pattern where agriculture tends to be in the less populated areas, and so um, there are some problems of scale to tease out there to figure out what are the best predictors for different types of environments moving across the urban soil area. And so um, we've teamed up with the. Um, BU Ultra team to look at rad presence absence along their transects, and Lucy's going to go into much more detail on this, this data set in <coughs> But basically, you can see that um, sites have been sampled from Boston out to Harvard Forest and Boston to Worcester. The land use categories are shown up in, in the top right, and this is rad presence in those plots. And so, again, in the non urban environments, um, you can see that forests, for example, do not support rad at all whereas residential and the other categories are places where we might expect to find it. But on the other hand, in the urban environment, what's considered forest from a land cover perspective is actually a place where you might expect to see ragweed. And so that's interesting because forest might mean a different thing in an urban landscape than in the Okay, so phase two, I'm just gonna give a brief overview. We're about to enter phase two of this study. This is um, a goal change experiment where ragweed ecotypes seeds collected from New York, Boston, and Burlington, Vermont, so again, moving across this broader urban to rural and temperature gradient, are grown in the common environment under predicted global change scenario. And so the goal is to um, use ambient, intermediate, and a doubling of, of CO2 as one of the main treatments <coughs> to begin to create re reaction modes for ecotypes from these different populations not only to just test whether or not there is variation and quantify how much there is, but also to um, inform the models, the modeling exercise for the future. And so that will bracket the range of response that we can expect to see in this species by knowing how it um, responds to these different variables in experimental settings. And again, the same risk factors that we measured at this time in the sort of greenhouse experimental setting for the time and the abundance and potency as well. In phase three, we really put this all together um, and begin to overlay spatial data for future scenario predictions. So for example, the IPCC and various sources of land cover data. Overlay that with what we know about ragweed distribution from the field studies that I just mentioned and that we're in the middle of doing. And then sample from the distributions of those data sets from those <coughs> experimental data sets. 
um, to begin to create spatially explicit risk maps for different future climate scenarios. So just to summarize, moving from the population biology to um, experimental studies to landscape scale pattern, I think we can improve on, and we all know CNN is a good source of information, but I think we can improve on um, the models. <laughs> So I think, you know, for future directions, I think it would be very worthwhile thinking about ways in which our work collectively can play into real life human health issues um, in, in that we can, you know, begin to talk about initiatives to integrate human health implications of, of the global change research that we do. And some various programs that, you know, that this is happening in or could happen in are the upcoming new LPER grant. Out in Arizona, there are some similar efforts doing this looking um, in the Phoenix landscape at pollen in a slightly different context, but um, there's a way to, to maybe think about, take some cues from what they're doing there. And as I said, we're collaborating with one of the ultra teams at the moment to think about this more broadly. And then to, um, again, begin thinking about how you know, other short-term collaborations might also be supported by this. But I do want to mention that in addition to ragweed, I think that this kind of model moving from the population to the landscape scale is something that's more broadly applicable not just to pollen, but also to particulate matter and also to other organisms, including microbes. And since we have a lot of people living with them, microbes as a whole can also be Right. Right. Do these bird traps are used for that context as 